just uh, want to introduce uh, Florian Kramer, that is Applied Research Professor and Director of the Creating uh, 010, the research center affiliated with the William de Koenig Academy and the Pittsburgh Institute at the Rotterdam, Uni Rotterdam University of Applied Science and also as a personal background in comparative literature and art history combined with post-punk and post-fluxus do-it-yourself culture. And uh, today I think you also will go a bit uh, back in the past of this kind of practices and so I leave uh, to you the, the world and then we engage a bit more in the conversation because uh, I think also through Florian we could create a really interesting line from uh, what was happening uh, in the 70s, 80s until also passing through uh, a certain use, uh, artistic use of media in the net art movement through today with the post-digital reflection. And uh, yeah, so I just passed it. Yes, but maybe I can, can just start with a kind of personal introduction <laughs> when perhaps why I'm sitting here is um, uh, as a teenager, I was born in 1969, I uh, also really grow, grew up with a kind of post-punk uh, do-it-yourself uh, culture in, in the beginning of the 1980s. I made my first uh, zine when I was 13 years old in 1982 and then came into a network uh, of well, a guy in Berlin called Graf Haufen, who was, happened to be a close friend of Vitore. Uh, uh, Actually, I saw the track tapes already when I was 14 and uh, uh, then became a kind of peripherally uh, uh, involved in Neoism, uh, was friends with uh, some Italians who started the Luther Bissett project and the Anna Adamolo uh, thing, maybe I can give away that much happened happened at my school actually. It started as a, as a, as a project at, at my school. And then uh, the other thing is that um, it's now the second time that I come to Ljubljana and to Slovenia. Um, so whenever I come, come to Slovenia and Ljubljana, I have the feeling I don't need to explain anything here because um, it's, it's already... Okay. Sorry, this is going on too much. This is already part of the, the, the culture here. Yeah, so um, these were pictures actually that I took yesterday. At, am I uh, correctly uh, pronounce, uh, pronouncing it at the uh, Metalkova um, um, uh, Museum? And if you see the basic collection of it, which is mostly about ex Slovenian, ex Yugoslavian, ex Eastern European underground, well, that's the stuff I think that we're talking here. So it's like preaching to the converted. This is a slide. Um, it says underneath um, at art series of events in private apartments, uh, photos of the participants in 1982, and this is somewhere from uh, ex Yugoslavia. Well, we had the same thing in, in Neoism in, in America, Northern America, the, the, the so-called apartment festivals in the early 1980s. And why? Because some of the people who set it up uh, were uh, Eastern European immigrants who were already used to the practice of having a non-official art scene where you could not have official spaces but you had to organize it in your apartments. So that, that was then integrated, let's say, it came together with uh, American post-1960s counterculture. Um, and uh, this is the other picture that I took that says Art Strike. Art Strike was also something that came up, uh, well, actually invented by Stuart Holm when he was still with the Neerism, the idea to have complete strike of artists between 1990 and 1993. You see, it was just taken up uh, here as well. I think the, the whole point is um, uh, if you try to explain these kind of networks and these activities to um, people in the art system, they, they, it's my experience working at an art school that they really don't get it. Um, and so what the fuck is that? And I think that they're not getting it because if you're looking at the kind of um, pre-1990 socialist underground movements, it was outside the the, the system of uh, socialist official art, but it was also outside the, the, the system of the Western art market and the, the so-called fine art. And this is why, why it's really hard to position why it still hasn't found, found, found its place. Now, um, uh, on the other hand, I think that when we talk about networking in art, that this is something that has been totally co-opted. We already talked about, uh, Vito mentioned that, that how networking now has become mainstream, let's say with Facebook, social networks, Google, etc. 
Um, and John will talk more about it because he comes from San Francisco, a city that has been transformed uh, from these former communities to the new companies. But um, I had the same ex experience yesterday when I went to Metalkova um, because they have a video room there that by itself is very nice, but it's run by Eflux. And Eflux is now the network that rules contemporary art. And they, they, they you really see uh, how this whole idea of artistic networks has been commodified and be basically become a kind of power uh, play. And uh, well, I al almost would say that, that the word networking now has become a dirty word uh, in, in contemporary world, uh, art because it's about building relations and building career networks. Um, so what, what I still consider, let's say, problematic in, in let's say, uh, centering a, a, a practice around the word networking that ultimately it's a kind of cybernetic idea. Yeah? Cybernetics started in the 1940s with the idea that you can basically superimpose technological structures of control and command to other areas of culture, politics and society. So if you do that, network, so network can be, let's say it can be a telephone network or it can be a computer network in the technical sense, but it can also be a, a social network or a collaboration network. And, and then the cybernetic uh, assumption would be that you can describe both phenomena in the same terms and using the same kind of structural models and analysis. Uh, now, network in these, these kind of command and control structures sounds friendlier, um, uh, but I think it's, it, it's, it's suffering from the same kind of problem, that, that it's ultimately a kind of technocratic uh, 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 concept. In, in the arts, I think it, network has mostly been used as a kind of counter-concept to the idea of the movement. Uh, because the movement, the artist movement, also the artist avant-garde, still has a very strong military co uh, connotation. Um, and uh, so, in just as Vittorio said, yeah, we have the counterculture of the 1960s, which then gave birth to the idea of the network as a kind of alternative to uh, structure to the movement. Um, and it, it developed male art, it developed media art, it also developed um, um, uh, 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 Silicon Valley. Um, I think there are two problems that exist and one opportunity. The, the problems is if the network becomes an end to itself, so maybe I, uh, my, my own perception differs from Vitoris at the point that I would say male art became less interesting for me when it uh, did defined itself as eternal network and, and let's say when the network became an end to itself, but I mean you showed, on the other hand you're showing very strong examples that there, you know, there's strong work being done within male art. Um, and the other problem is when it becomes a kind of community. A community means you, you, you have uh, to ha have a kind of consensus culture. And I, I would say for me, the power of the networks and the most interesting things is the fact that uh, uh, unlike a movement, they're not easily controllable. And uh, because they're not un un easily controllable, um, often what happens in them is quite unpredictable um, and it's also not politically correct. Um, so for example, when I... Uh, in, in the early 1990s, I think that was in 1994 and 1995, uh, when I got a kind of side uh, player or friend uh, of the Italian Luther Visit Network, I got this anonymously <coughs> by mail. Uh, Europe, love it or leave it, but where a nigger's Luther Visit is around. So I don't know, you know, where, what the background of this was. Was it actually meant as a kind of neo-fascist statement or was it a parody of that? Um, but the, the interesting point, I think, in these, these kind of collective anonymous networks is that you couldn't really know uh, who was participating and then and with which kind of directions it would take and which kind of weirdos would use it for, uh, for the end uh, and, and also use, use its identity and its names. Um, uh, another example that already has been mentioned uh, by Vitor, I'm, it's, I'm, we didn't prepare this in sync, but this is actually... Um, this is enlarged from, from uh, Vile magazine, one of the male art uh, magazines that was the first kind of parody of Vile magazine by, by General Idea, which then was the parody of Life magazine. This is a letter to the editor by Genesis Piorich, uh, whom I think many of you know as the, one of the founders of industrial music and industrial culture, uh, and also as a transgressive performance artist that he's embodied art, that he still is today. Uh, and here he talks about how they had an, um, uh, uh, a kind of pornographic uh, performance in Germany and were, were uh, uh, arrested in, in, uh, by the police. This was an 
project and exhibition that they did um, in 1976 in London uh, at the ICA called Prostitution, where, where they also showed, showed pornographic uh, installations, and there was a big controversy. Uh, I think it was shut well, down by the police. He, he used, to, used to mail uh, yeah. posters with the Queen that he would put some uh, erotic collages on. Right. So he was uh, arrested and processed in Switzerland because he had made to Switzerland yes. with, uh, these things. And, uh, um, he always had problems with Scotland Yard yeah. because of his mail. So yeah. th there's one piece of this uh, poster with the Queen at the show down yeah. in the gallery. And whom we see here is this is actually Cosi Tutti, who was uh, also one of the the uh, integral um, members of uh, Fabian Gristle later, uh, and then of Psychic TV. And, and she was back at that time also working as a as a model uh, for pornographic magazines, so, so that became part of the, the uh, performance art. Uh, I have an even, even more controversial example from, from early male art, this is from 1975. We, um, it was the Adolf Hitler uh, uh, fan club by Pauline Smith, uh, oh. a, a British uh, male artist. You for sure have yeah, been yeah, exposed to that. Yeah, the, the, the fun thing with, uh, with Pauline Smith is that you really couldn't tell if it, she was serious or not, which makes the art action, of course, even more uh, effective. Yes, and again, um, there, there is a magazine yeah, by Anna Bananas, uh, Vile, a kind of comprehensive co collection that is it's called About Vile, and it has a whole chapter on, on her, on Pauline Smith, and um, it, it's, quite, it's quite clear that, that you know, it was not, not just a kind of parodistic act or provocative action by her. She said that she actually she, she, she had read Mein Kampf in 1971, and she was struck, we cannot really see it here, uh, she was struck by the, the um, description uh, that Hitler made of um, decadent Austrian democracy uh, 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 prior to World War I, and she uh, could um, make a direct uh, connection to British governments uh, in 1971, rough with the destruction of the community in which I lived, was being carried out by commercially motivated people, uh, whilst those who had the power to prevent this happening stood uh, by like weeds in the wind. And uh, so, so actually, she had a fascination for Adolf Hitler because she 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 reread him as a kind of uh, social critic uh, uh, of his time. Uh, and um, uh, when she was uh, doing these these male art pieces with Adolf Hitler fan club, she eventually was also raided by Scotland Yard. And, and, and got, got well, into this trouble. This to show that Mela was not politically correct at all. Yeah, yes. yeah. It was not, no, not, not at all. And I think that, that was also one of the, 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 for me, retrospectively looking at Mela, when, when, when Mela was really strong, when it was really countercultural, and when, when things happened in it that, that also escaped uh, the kind of logic of, let's say, um, yeah, the community. Um, and uh, we have now a similar occurrence nowadays with, with uh, 4chan um, and Anonymous, the Anonymous movement. And I think nowadays most people know Anonymous as the, the guy Fox mouse that people wear on the streets and uh, it has been uh, really been popularized after the, the Occupy uh, uh, protests. But what few people know are the actual origins of, of um, uh, uh, Anonymous and um, maybe it, it will become clearer in the exhibition it really started as, as uh, on so-called image boards. Image boards were something that, that uh, came from Japanese manga culture, and they're very simple uh, kind of internet discussion forums where people can just uh, post uh, pictures and make some comments, and they have a kind of um, culture where, you know, which is very black humorous and very grotesque and obscene and even pornographic, and people you know, put on stupid pictures and make stupid uh, uh, comments, and it has its own slang, and it's, it's, it's completely its own subculture. But the most important uh, phenomenon um, of these image boards, and the most uh, popular <coughs> one in, in the Western world is called 4chan, 4chan.org, um, is that you uh, do not need to have an account. So you, everyone can post on them. And if you do not register, then you are anonymous. So um, any image or text that you post will, uh, by default, appear with the username anonymous. And the anonymous movement was nothing else in the beginning than those people posting on 4chan who appeared as anonymous. Because automatically, by default of that system, anonymous was their kind of collective uh, moniker. Yeah? You became anonymous in the same way, let's say, you would have an image board and it would... Uh, 
uh, call everyone automatically uh, Janis, Janis uh, Janja or, or Luther Blissett or Monty Kensen, yeah? and, and then, then, then you would automatically opt into that, into that culture. Now, what we see nowadays, what I find interesting is that despite that, and despite those quite unpredictable and controversial uh, and also politically incorrect uh, uh, origins that Anonymous, I think perhaps through the street protests, uh, really tried uh, to, to uh, redefine itself as a movement. It called itself a, the Anonymous uh, movement. Um, it, it took upon a kind of corporate identity, which we have seen here and also in the previous um, uh, uh, discussion. And what we also now see is that there's really partly a rift within that movement uh, one of the latest things that happened in that, that uh, culture is the so-called Gamergate. Um, for those of you who are a little bit in, in, into internet culture, there is um, a feminist project which is called The Feminist Frequency. It's mostly a YouTube channel, and it started with feminist critiques of like, uh, uh, stereotyping of uh, women in, in Hollywood movies. And then they started a new uh, series of videos which was on, on uh, female uh, stereotyping in video games. And that totally upset people from the image board culture because that, that's very closely linked to gamer culture. It's of course very much a kind of body uh, and also quite quite macho uh, uh, culture, where you know where you have those ego shooters where I don't know uh, uh, all the, the female characters would be basically, basically prostitutes and you would get extra points if you if you shoot them etc etc. All that was addressed on the female frequency uh, videos, but it really has. Uh, uh, resulted in a kind of witch hunt uh, for for um, the, the the journalist, the blogger who has made these videos, and also a number of female uh, game developers, and even to the point where they had death uh, threats, etc., where people tracked down their private addresses, etc., etc. Now this was coming from 4chan, from from let's say the same kind of breeding ground for the anonymous movement, and what I've posted here is actually. Um, a blog post on a, on a video uh, YouTube message by Anonymous where they try to stop this, uh, this kind of witch hunt, where they say, well, these people are not acting on behalf of uh, Anonymous, and the, the, the two people have been mostly uh, active in this, this kind of anti, uh, um, anti-feminist frequency uh, uh, action, are detractors from, from Anonymous um, who betray the movement, etc. And now you get this kind of now you get this typical rhetoric that you also have in political parties, like in socialist parties, or in former times, for example, in the uh, in the surrealist movement, where Andre Breton subsequently uh, kicked everyone out because they were not uh, 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 um, acting according to the party line. Or the same with the situation as international in the 1960s, where in the end it was only Guy Debord and one other guy because he had kicked uh, um, uh, out uh, I don't know 40 people because because they were somehow uh, not not. Uh, uh, following uh, their leaders' uh, uh, politics, and I think the same is now happening with with, with anonymous. Uh, and um, there you also see that, um, uh, let's say, the the, the 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 problem really is if if um, there is no room for ambiguity um, uh, in in these uh, movements, uh, if they uh, try to have a, a, a control um, uh, over their party line. Um, and also, I find it really curious and, and funny in the, in the case of Anonymous, because just like with all these, these movements and networks that, that we have described, Luther Blissett, Neoism, I could also t- take NSK, Leibach uh, as an example. To some degree, they're all used to totalitarian and fascist imagery. I mean, I think, I think also that, 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 that Anonymous is incredibly fascist in its Im- imagery, just uh, in the slide that, that, that they have uh, shown. But they're not acknowledging that in, in, in their own uh, uh, self-reflection. Now, um, but I, I, I want to wrap up just uh, to go, going back to networking. Um, I, I think this kind of, let's say, this disrupt, the, the potential for disruptiveness, yeah, this, this kind of not uh, complying to the party line, uh, to fuck things up, to do, do things that are unpredictable or uh, that totally go against... Uh, 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 people's uh, 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 convictions is still the power of, of these, these networks, that they create these uncontrollable situations and, and, and dynamics. It can be also dangerous. I mean, it can also turn into a kind of witch hunt mob, uh, which we are now just seeing in the case of, of uh, uh, 4chan. Um, 4chan has also been in, uh, behind the, 
the leaking of the new pictures of, of uh, Hollywood, uh, female Hollywood stars whose um, uh, iCloud uh, um, uh, accounts have been hacked. Um, uh, then on the other hand, Eflux and Facebook show that networking you know, can, be, can be exploited, can be uh, commodified. Um, so the question is, you know, to, to which degree does disruption um, uh, no longer be, uh, uh, or ha to, to which degree is disruption no longer something that happens uh, in networks, but rather that, that needs to be disruption of networking. Um, uh, and that's all I have to say. So it's, for me, it's really question marks at this moment. It's really the question how, how, how will we go on with this? It's, it isn't a lot of, of the practices that we are, pract uh, that we are showing here. Uh, don't they need rethinking? Because uh, so much of it has been, been now appropriated into the mainstream. Thanks.